have been asking a lot of questions recently, and I appreciate that a ton. So today we're gonna answer a lot of you guys' questions, kind of giving you a background of how I do things, a little bit about how much money I make, my schedule coming up, my traveling, and my background in disc golf and in like business content creation before this all started. And one thing that really helps with that, especially now, is the sponsor of today's video, FlexiSpot. And more specifically, this E7 standing desk, which is a premium standing desk. Moving out of the van and into an apartment, I knew that I wanted to get a standing desk. Also, this has four programmable functions that just like go to automatic heights. I, I probably should stand up, that makes sense. And so when FlexiSpot had reached out to me, letting me know that they were interested in sponsoring a video, I was super intrigued, because the E7 here is super sturdy, even at it's standing height like I can I can move it but I have to actually move it I put you guys on a tripod on this desk all the time while I'm using it and you guys know that I'm pretty animated with my movements and things are not moving around very much one of the things I love about FlexiSpot is they sent out a lot of accessories to go with the desk because not only is this the 55 inch by 28 inch standing desk with a bamboo top and the white base because it just looks clean in my opinion I also have a drawer here which I love because that allows me to have my notebook and some pens and sharpies readily accessible clamp on outlet extender because is that way I can charge my phone or AirPods or whatever I need to, and additional cable management underneath the desk. Now, like I said, this is a very stable desk, which is really important because being able to have a desk that I can confidently stand at is really helpful for a healthy lifestyle for me because when I'm not on the course, honestly, I'm here. Probably only 20 to 30% of my work week is actually out playing disc golf. The rest of it is here doing work, mostly editing videos. And so being able to stand up while I do that really helps to encourage the blood flow. But sometimes if I'm lazy, we can just bring it back down. But if you're interested in even more stability, there's actually a four-legged version instead of the two-legged one that I have here. And that's the FlexiSpot E7Q. I'm a big believer that the environment that you put yourself in really affects how you're able to work. And so having the FlexiSpot E7 has been a game changer for me. As I always say, supporting the sponsors who support me is very helpful in continuing to allow me to make the best videos that I can and to continue traveling around a little bit like we'll talk about in a second. And so if you're in the market for upgrading your work from home or study from home setup, the FlexiSpot E7 standing desk, and I've tried a couple, is the best standing desk that I've tried, and it comes with the most built-in accessories. It comes with a 30-day risk-free return policy, and if you're worried about anything breaking, it actually has a 15-year warranty on it. And if you don't have an additional monitor like I do with my laptop, one of the other ways that I've used this is actually with a laptop riser from FlexiSpot as well, which also helps me to elevate that monitor closer to eye level, making it a little bit healthier for me so that I'm not looking down for eight to 10 hours out of the day. If you want to pick one of these up, like always, please use the links in my description. It really helps FlexiSpot to know that they made a right choice in sponsoring this video and helps me to get future sponsors. This is the best standing desk that I've ever used. If you're looking for one, definitely get the FlexiSpot E7. So today we're going to play through 18 holes-ish. This place is always super crowded, so we have four glitches. We're going to try to ace as much as we can, if that's even one time. And every hole, I'm just going to walk you through this story based on questions that you guys asked on Instagram and YouTube. Uh, so thank you for asking those questions, people. Got to start out with the one that I aced with here first. Oh, gross. So to start out, Michael asked, what were my life plans before I wanted to be a professional disc golfer? And hi hi the hi hi asked, what were my video editing experience before getting started on YouTube? That's it. Oh. Honestly, these questions intertwine, which is why I linked them together. Because before I started this YouTube channel, I actually had another YouTube channel. I haven't posted on it in about seven months, because so I really just dove all into this disc golf one. I will be posting on it again soon, talking a lot about navigating life as a creative professional. But I had started like five or six YouTube channels even before that, that all kind of petered out after one or two videos. But I always wanted to create videos on YouTube and be a content creator, influencer, I guess. Spinnies for Simon. We hate Simon, apparently. And even now, we'll get into this a tiny bit. My goal is not to be necessarily a professional disc golfer, because I think the money still for the next little bit is gonna be in creating content, not playing professional disc golf, even though I want to be a professional disc golfer. Glitches are so good, dude. But in July of 2019 is when I started my other channel, and so I had about three years of video editing experience before I started this channel in June of last year. Mark asked, how do I get my calf so beefy, which I think is mostly genetics. Most Off Design asked what other sports have I played throughout my life, and Gabriel Lopez asked to give a more in-depth breakdown of my past athletic experience. I have always done athletic things like sports are just what I did in my downtime growing up. I did play soccer, not at a high level, played a little bit of ultimate, like church league ultimate growing up, but having that athletic background, even if it's not like super serious, I think is what gave me good proprioception or like good coordination. If I tell my body to do something, it's a little bit better at doing it than somebody who might not have that athletic background. So I think I'm able to pick up on things pretty fast just because I've basically, since I was like a child, always been into doing athletic things. That might be good. I just floated down there. One thing that helped me get good fast that I cannot overlook is the fact that I've worked for myself since 2020. I was able to really dive headfirst into disc golf, and since I was creating content, eventually I was able to start making more content for disc golf. 
Good thing the first one counts. DX Mini and Connor L Disc Golf asked, how did I find disc golf? And honestly, it comes down to a buddy of mine named Sam. When I had told him that I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee in my van, because we moved into the van in September of 2021, and I didn't find disc golf until January 2022, I had an ultimate disc though. We were staying for the day and working at a park that had a disc golf course. And so I played it with the ultimate disc and I told my buddy, he's like, I have some discs for you. So when we swung through Kansas City to visit him, he gave me six discs. But I got all those discs and then a week or two later, we were in Austin at Zoker Park and we stayed there in the van. And that's where I played my first round of disc golf, January like 18th of 2022. Glitch, dang it. A 275 foot hole, not a bad grouping with these three. An interesting question that I got, which I think is a good question, is actually about how long it took me to get under par. And if we go all the way back to the beginning, it's like 320 rounds. Look, this is the crazy thing. My profile, I have been playing since January 23rd on here, and I have 346 rounds and 184 courses played, which is kind of nuts. If we go back to all the way to the beginning of my rounds, I would play my best disc and see how I would score and then how I would score. That's one of the ways that I felt like it was good to practice and get better. But it took me about three months-ish until probably close to about May of last year when I was in Utah sometime. This is a nice aceable 160 feet right up there. Got it. No. That's it. Oh, and honestly, I have about 70 videos that are probably never gonna see the light of day sitting on a hard drive from when I was doing POV stuff with the GoPro on my head. That was back in May or June, which actually leads us to the next question. Anthony and Richard both asked how long I played before I started recording my rounds. And I definitely think this would be different if I didn't have a background in creating videos because when I got started playing disc golf, I would watch a lot of disc golf videos and realize like what made me turn disc golf videos off. And I realized that there was a market for a new style of disc golf content, which is more similar to my other style on my other channel, which is very fast paced style that some people complain about in the comments, but I mean, my content's not gonna be for everybody. I started shooting videos in the beginning of May and didn't post anything until the beginning of June and didn't really take it seriously until probably September-ish. Did I do it? Oh my gosh, that was inches. Still a dumb hole. And I know not everybody cares about this, which is why it's gonna, I'm gonna keep it short and sweet, but I got a couple questions. One from Disc Respect Disc Golf and one from DTR are like, what is a tip for YouTube or your biggest tip for someone starting out on YouTube? And real quick, I'm gonna share with you guys all the stuff that I use in my office tour, and then we'll come back here and give you my couple biggest tips. But first, I got an ace. Short. Stay up. So this is just a really cheap $30 bookshelf that I got from Walmart. I keep a lot of paper up here because I like writing stuff down as well as some dry erase boards. This right here is the first camera that I bought to shoot on the Canon M50. And so this is just staying up here as a keepsake, even though it bricked itself when I won my first MN1 tournament, if you remember that video. I have a lot of GoPro accessories here, a bunch of SD cards and I use 128 gig, really nice ones because I shoot in 4K 10-bit 422 on the Sony A7 IV. I use the DJI lav mic system, which I actually am wearing right now underneath the shirt with a magnet. Some extra batteries, all my charging station right here. Another lens, which is a 12 to 28 Sigma 2.8. And the one that's on the camera right now is the Sony 20 to 70 F4. And I also have a shotgun microphone. Got a bunch of stuff to ship stuff because of all these discs that we have to worry about. Writing stuff, miscellaneous camera stuff, power stuff, miscellaneous stuff, disc to review, workout stuff, tripods, and then I use a small rig RC120B. I have the Samson Q9U microphone with the Samson boom arm, which makes life a little bit easier for voiceovers. 16 inch MacBook, Premiere Pro on a 32 inch 4K screen, MX keys, MX Master 3 from Logitech, USB C dock, and then this is where I put all of my footage once I'm done editing it. And obviously the sweet FlexiSpot E7. I am so happy to have this desk. This is such a nice desk. The biggest tip that I have for people is that you need to put out content consistently because your audience needs to be able to expect that of you. You need to be different, differentiate yourself, and you need to learn how to tell stories because every video is a story. Even these videos, even me going and doing a disc review, those are stories. But the biggest thing I would say is the consistency. And you don't wanna just be consistent and just put out stuff every day. You wanna put out the highest quality videos that you can consistently put out. But try to make one thing in your video better than the last video. It doesn't have to be everything in your video. Your video can be cumulatively worse, but if you learn one thing every video, over the course of a ton of videos, it's gonna get better. Like I have 300 videos on this channel and I had a couple hundred on the other channel before I started this channel. And so all that video editing experience rolls up into what I am able to do now. Too low. Perfect. 
Snipes, probably N-S-X-P-E-S. -E How do you stay motivated to keep posting? There's another question along with that. I know it's financially rewarding to keep posting from William and like the frequency is really important. So how do I stay motivated to keep doing it? And it's multi-part. One is right now we're gonna get to it. I'm making just enough income that we're able to live here and be semi-comfortable uh, still a little scary at times, but I just love making videos. And obviously I want to increase my income. The more videos I put out and the more audience I grow, the less I'll have to do in the long run. But I just love making videos. And that's why I say it's so important to love making videos because I just love making videos. And that's what keeps me motivated is just a passion for doing it. That was so bad. Perfect. Just fade a bit, dude. Just fade a little tiny bit. A little air bounce for Simon. Oh, it actually worked this time. I just threw it way over top. <laughs> Next question comes from GMAC as well as M Fuller. Now that you're not on the road, do you miss playing courses all over or is playing a new course each week or month a hassle? And what's the hardest part of being a disc golfer always on the road? Honestly, you spend about 20 to 30 hours a week just living, trying to find where to sleep, trying to find bathrooms, showers. You have to restock your food a little bit more often than you do in your apartment. But I did love traveling. And we're actually gonna get to a little bit of a travel schedule because I am gonna start to travel a little bit more. I was talking a lot about how I was going to sell the van, but I think because of some tournaments I'm playing and just the ease of living out of a van and knowing how to do it, we're actually gonna keep the van and fix it up a little bit. So the van is not gonna go away, but I'd say the hardest part is definitely just how much time it takes you to live. And that takes away from either training or work time. And since this is my job and training is a little bit secondary right now until this grows to a point where I can do less work and make the same amount of money, that's what it is. Got a little more juice. Good to the forehand disc, confirmed. Stand up. Oh, those are not bad. The next one is a question I know a lot of you guys have been dying for me to answer. But I know Bear Bite Disc Golf especially has been waiting for me to answer this question. No! But he asks, who's got the deep pockets? And if you think there's deep pockets right here, the top, this is like a deepish pocket. The pockets are like, they're like there. On YouTube, you make money from ads being shown in your videos. And so if you ever watch a video of mine before the video, during the video, after the video, if you watch an ad, you're helping to support me. And so that's why I say watching is more than enough because it does pay a lot of the bills, not all of them yet, hopefully soon. But ad rates are different across all channels, which is why my other channel I love so much, the one that's about navigating life as a creative pro, that one I make about three times the ad rate as I typically do on disc golf videos, which is why I'm gonna start posting there a little bit more, just to increase that income so I can make sure that I'm traveling. And the length of time also matters a lot. If a video is over eight minutes but under 10, I'll typically make about $5.50 per thousand views. If it's between kind of 10 to 12, it might be six to six and a half. 12 to 15 is anywhere from seven to $8. 15 to 20 is typically around seven to $9. And over 20 is normally like 10 to $11. I never wanna make like a 20 minute video arbitrarily because I wanna make sure that I'm putting out videos that you guys will watch the majority of. And my analytics will tell me a lot. So I try to put out videos that fit the content that I put out, but I'm trying to also figure out longer videos to put out because they just make me more money for a very similar amount of work in terms of edit time and shoot time. Might be why this video might be 20 minutes. I'm not sure how long it's gonna be. Ad revenue isn't my full income though, and I typically will average around $8. However many thousand views I get on a video, multiply that by eight, it's typically how much I'm making on that video, unless it's really short. Now I run all of this as an actual business, and my other YouTube channel still makes me about $1,500 to $2,000 a month from ad revenue, from ads that show on that, as well as some affiliate links, like you see links in my description typically. I have some subscriptions that are more business-based that pay a lot more than your typical affiliate links here. But on this channel, I also have some affiliate links I have Patreon, I do some sponsorships that I would love to increase the amount of those, but I'm working with sponsors like Flexispot is actually really helpful because they have a base of understanding of how influencer marketing works, whereas not a lot of companies in disc golf do, so it's a little bit harder to get sponsors in disc golf. Stable out. Dang. Step, 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 step. Oh my gosh. Dang, off the little woodwork and into the cage. Finally got a metal hit today though. But the disc golf side of things alone, not including disc sales, cause that's a little bit different. I have to buy those up front and then, and sometimes discs don't sell out as fast as I want or whatever. So there's differences that happen consistently through that. But I'd say my typical month when I'm not selling discs, my disc golf stuff makes about four to $5,000 somewhere in there from ad revenue and everything. And this is me working 60 plus hours a week on the content, but it's just cause I love it. And I know that the future, there's potential for it to grow a lot. And then for reference, my take home pay. So what I pay myself out of the business after taxes and everything from the business including some stuff that my wife does, some Amazon affiliate stuff that we do as well, is about $50,000 a year. So not a lot of money, including this channel and the other channel, but it's enough. 
And as the channel continues to grow, that income should go up. So maybe next year, if we do a recap, maybe it's six figures and that'd be awesome. Um, but I appreciate you guys so much for even just letting me do this full time. And then one question that I actually wanna stick on to here was from local disc golf. But they ask, as aspiring content creators ourselves, can disc golf content actually create enough income to support you? Full time, just you living somewhere, it's very hard. You can check on like a bunch of things like Social Blade. The only people who get more views in a month than I do are Foundation Disc Golf, Brody, Ezra, Simon, and like Joe Mez, those content houses, uh, the production companies. So for doing how many views I do, which is typically between three and 400,000 views a month on just videos, it's really hard. And that's why I like selling discs and I'm gonna try to create more things that I can sell because those margins get a little bit better, which is why Foundation probably does well. They also have a lot of overhead. I don't want anybody to work for me and I don't wanna work for anybody. So that becomes a little bit different, but you need to produce a lot of content for disc golf to support you and that's why I'm really trying to start creating content on my other channel as well so that I can continue to do this as much as I do but make more money that's compensatory to the time that I'm putting into it flip too low one of the things that was important to me too though is I see the future and like, in the, I don't see the future, but in the next three to five years, as disc golf continues to grow, as my channel continues to grow, it'll be more feasible that me just getting ad revenue from videos will pay for a pretty decent lifestyle, hopefully, but that's years and years of work, doing it full-time working, like I said, more than full-time hours. Is it possible? Yes. I think it's for the next two years, probable for like four or five people, unless you do coaching and stuff. And I don't want to do coaching because I'm not a good coach. There are ways to make it happen, but just being focused on being an influencer, being a content creator, it is barely happening. But supplementing it with other things, you can do this full time. And it can be very rewarding because I absolutely love what I do. The next question is a good one. It's about how my form rebuild has worked out from artificial intelligence, Big Jake lifts weights. What's one thing about training to make the pro tour that you underestimated? Honestly, a lot of it is just the time commitment, the inability of your body to adapt super quickly. Honestly, my form change has been a very, I've been very happy with how it's been. We're a month into our move and it's a little more settled, but there's just not been as much time as I'd want. So throughout the season, I'm gonna be training as well as playing disc golf. Get down. Oh, I think too, the importance of sleep and nutrition and hydration is so important for just like keeping your body healthy and being able to continue going through it. But overall, I think my form change has been good. My distance has been increasing. And I think throughout the season, it will continue to do so. And I just am reminded back of last season where I didn't worry about it. I just let my body take over. And I added about 50 plus feet of usable distance during the season. I think that can happen again this year, but my base is better. So my ceiling is higher. Cody asks, how's the transition been from living in a van to living in an apartment? And has it helped to hurt my relationship with my wife? I'd say it's definitely helped to give us just a little bit of a steady place to live. Lucky. And the transition has been pretty smooth. I'm kind of surprised that we are keeping the van. It makes sense. Get in. Nope. Based on the traveling that I'm going to be doing that I'll talk about in a second. Sharing my tour schedule and stuff. Dang it. Never. But having a home base to work from has been so nice because in the van I had to set up and tear down my workstation consistently. And now having this desk as well as everything just already being able to be set up has been so beneficial to making my workflow faster and making me put out better content in the same amount of time, which I've been really happy with. Now we're getting to a little bit more disc golf related in this year questions. Kyle says he's been watching from the beginning and I've claimed a journey to the pro tour. I've claimed uh, cashing at a pro tour event. And Kyle's question is that how am I going to evolve my game when I'm constantly changing out discs left and right? Which I can understand if you've been watching my videos, it's off season, but I also haven't been playing with my bag almost at all. Sink the Tank says, are you planning on doing it in the bag before I started playing tournaments? We'd love to know what this you do. Yes, I'm definitely planning on doing it. And my philosophy for my bag, which we'll dig into more in that video, is I'm going to treat my bag as a sponsored bag. I'm not sponsored by anybody and I don't want to be this year. I'm hoping that next year that can happen and also be something that ups my income a little bit. So I'm not having to make all of it on my own, but I can represent a company and be paid very adequately for it. This year, I'm treating my bag as if it's sponsored so that I can't add or take out anything. And I'm in the final stages of final it. There's a couple slots that I'm still really trying to figure out, but once those are figured out, that will go up and I'm really starting to train with it this week because my tournament season starts in two weeks. Also, spoiler, Glitch is actually totally going in the bag. That could do it. Stay up. Oh my gosh. LJ asked if I have a schedule for this season. My schedule starts the fifth through seventh. I'm still waitlisted, but I'm number four, so I should get in to an A tier called 303, where like Aaron Gossage and some other big names are gonna be. The next week I have a B tier in Pagosa Springs. The next week I have a B tier here. The next week, I think I have either a B or C tier in Kansas City, which is two days, four different courses, one of which I played like one time with Apollo Disc Golf. So I'm gonna have to go there early and learn, which is one of the reasons why I'm keeping the van. But that one is a qualifier for Des Moines Challenge if you get top two. Not expecting it, but 
Might as well give myself a chance at it. And then the week after, I'm actually gonna go down probably to Arkansas to meet with a content creator. Then I come back up here to an hour north of this area to an A tier or another couple of big names. Joel Friedman's gonna be there and some other people. And the week after, I go back to either Kansas City or Emporia, because I am waitlisted for DDO. Don't think I'll get in, I'm like number 19, but I am waitlisted, so if enough people drop, I could get into DDO and go play the Elite event. Don't have a lot of plans after that, except for Rochester Flying Disc Open. If there are still spots available in 10 days when I'm able to sign up, I will sign up for that. Same with the Disc Mania Open, which is in PEI. Those are both like surrounding worlds in August and September-ish, so that would be a lot of fun to be able to go and play those, and they should be my first events if I'm able to get into, which I think I'll be able to get into at least one, probably Disc Mania Open. We have a couple more interesting questions, one of which I am, very excited about. That's just the last question. It's a good question. It's about how much money a sponsoring company would have to pay me to throw only their discs. Cody asked that. I think it's probably my favorite question that I got. Stay up. Oh, we're so high. Let it turn. Yep. Come back. Oh, juice, death. Stay up, stay up, stay up, stay up, stay up. Oh, that's so close. So while we collect these goodies, how much would a sponsor have to shell out for me to be on their team? I think this is dependent on a couple of things. One, it's hard to know how much money sponsors are willing to pay, especially when I feel like I have a specific value, knowing how many views I get and how much plastic I can move on my own. I'm also not plugging anybody for the hundreds of thousands of views every month that I get on disc reviews, which could be funneled towards a company if I get sponsored by a retailer. Manufacturer could be a little bit different. A manufacturer and retailer is really an interesting proposition. For me, I think it'd have to be close to six figures or multiple six figures, depending on which one, with some guaranteed money. I'm okay with some of it being bonuses or something, but having a salary to produce so much as I do is really important because there is value just in market awareness and getting 400,000 views a month and having basically all of that attached to a company. Like if I was to charge for that, it would be 100,000 plus a year. Like if I booked sponsors on every single video, that doesn't account for the potential increase in views, subscribership, as the sport grows and as my channel continues to gain more viewers. The ideal for me would probably be a retailer, but it's hard to say because a manufacturer, I would probably want more money because there'd be a lot of lost opportunity costs there in terms of the videos I can make without their discs, but it also make it a much bigger challenge for me to create content, which is why a retailer is probably the ideal for me. And that's where it can be a little bit easier to have some guaranteed money and some incentive-based money for both play as well as affiliate sales, as well as selling of my own discs. And that's a really hard question to answer of how much, but hopefully that gets answered throughout this year because someone's willing to throw it down. I think I'll be a great addition to a lot of teams and if uh, companies are looking, especially retailers, and they're very interested, I would love to talk towards the end of this year about what it would look like to be a part of someone's team. Hopefully that's in the six figure plus range. Not 100% sure, but I probably wouldn't say yes with less than that because I'm trying to build my other channel and my other business streams up that I don't need to say yes to anybody. I like being able to say hell yes and hell no, meaning I can be very enthusiastic with whatever I say to anybody. <laughs> Last chance. Oh, juiced it terribly straight. So I hope this answers a ton of questions about who I am, kind of what my background is, what the future might hold for the content and the channel as the channel grows and we're able to do more and bigger and more fun things. I hope you guys will stick around. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing that. Sorry I couldn't ace for you today. Glitches are still so money though. If you're in the market for upgrading your workspace, definitely use my links down below to buy a FlexiSpot E7. If you want another really fun video that does include an ace, not with a glitch, but I do throw glitches in it, check it out right down there. It was a blast. As always, I appreciate you guys a lot and I always mean it when I say, okay, love you guys, bye.